All right. Um, my name is Itai Karen. I made a game called Mushroom 11, uh, released a couple of years ago. It's a game with uh, very peculiar and weird mechanics and even weirder bosses. Uh, I also made a research a couple of years ago on uh, 2D cameras and I decided to combine my two passions and uh, try to create this uh, retrospective of game bosses and what we can learn from uh, using references from older to more modern games. So, what is a game boss? Um, a standard definition would look a little bit like this. A significant computer-controlled enemy who must be defeated to achieve a goal or continue progress. But we all know that the bosses that we remember uh, and we like usually have one or more of these items as an exception to this rule. And from what I noticed, it is closer to just an epic confrontation that serves as a microcosm of your game while tempor temporarily breaking its rules. So the boss battle is par definitely part of your game. It needs to feel uh, as part of the unit, which is your game, but it's uniquely qualified to break any and all of the rules. Um, why do you need a, a boss? Uh, I, I basically look at it as a four different uh, sections. Uh, reward, take a break from normal gameplay and reward players' persistence with a new experience and a chance at a major triumph. Dazzle, surprise the player with an unexpected play experience. Engage, uh, use the battle to advance the story or create an emotional attachment and challenge, of course, that test and acquire skill, introduce new skills in pre preparation for uh, what's next, and we're gonna talk about all these. Um, so, shock and awe, how we can dazzle the players with unexpected confrontation and, while creating a lasting first impression and you're probably gonna notice that I haven't really put too much effort into the images because that's boring. All right, so uh, what's the most important uh, element, even going back to 1975, um, this is what's considered uh, possibly the first boss battle. It's basically just an enemy uh, with a, an unexpected strength. It is way more powerful than the player expected. Um, it's also very unlikely for you to win against uh, the dragon in uh, the dungeon. Uh, and it feels like a David and Goliath. It's uh, kind of the thread that go goes across um, pretty much all boss battles. Uh, a an easy way to create, or like the, the standard way of creating a boss that feels invincible is using the size. This is Mothership from Phoenix from 1980, uh, what I consider probably the first modern boss. Uh, the size uh, is uh, so large, it also feels like it's almost impossible to, uh, to uh, defeat. This is uh, possibly one of the best uh, boss battles in, in all time. I'm going to talk about it a lot. Um, and this is a great example of how we can use technology in order to create the illusion of size and, and how tech can serve the design. In this case, um, it was running on the NES. The NES has a limitation of 64 foreground sprites. Uh, each one of them is 8x8 or 8x16, um, which means that they had to create a boss mostly on the background, and every time a piece needed to move from one side to the next, um, they moved it to the foreground, animated it, and then put it back to the background. Um, a few decades later, uh, and another game used uh, uh, incredible technology for the time. Uh, this is Shadow of the Colossus. We're going to talk about that game a lot. Um, they created a, a physics system that's based on uh, partially uh, dynamic, huge objects that uh, influence the protagonist with its own inverse kinematics. Um, moving forward through the years, uh, God of War is a franchise that has uh, some epic uh, bosses, huge bosses, and um, we, when we're trying to continuously surprise the player, it, they end up in increasing, increasing the size of the boss continuously. Uh, this, the bosses in uh, uh, God of War allow you to change the rules during play. In this case, the second fa phase of the boss is a, is a level in itself where you need to uh, battle the boss from the inside. Uh, and all the way to the comically large, this is Gong and Wizen from Asura's Wrath. Uh, the last phase of this boss is, um, is, is so is l larger than the planet, um, and of course, at some point it becomes uh, 
kind of it's not the same battle obviously so you, it allows you to completely change your rules um we're going to talk about surprising the player and uh, that is probably one of the best examples of how you would able to would be able to surprise the player in pretty much every aspect this is um sinistar from 1982 from Noah Falstein and, and team, um, they were able to create a, a game, a space game, where that completely was different from the space games of the time, in both in terms of visuals, uh, the presentation, the theme, even the mechanics was much more complicated, and it's mostly known for its crazy digitized voice. I had to ask. Um, Again, to, uh, to surprise the players, you can use all sorts of methods, uh, uh, scare, the, scare the hell out of the players, as you've seen in many of the bosses in um, Silent Hill uh, franchise. Uh, and of course, this memorable boss, the great Mighty Pooh from Conker's Be uh, Bed Fur Day. Uh, using humor and the presentation was something that I think everybody who played this game uh, really remembers it well. Uh, and uh, of course there are bosses in games that you wouldn't expect to have bosses. This is uh, Mario Kart DS um, surprisingly has bosses as well. Uh, we're going to talk about very various different types of surprises um, throughout this talk. This is just a quick presentation. All right, moving on. Engage. How uh, we can use gameplay, the, the pause in gameplay to tell a story, and build anticipation towards the battle and revel in its outcome. So the stories back in the early days of uh, video games were mostly a tr the traditional story frame. A uh, boy saves a girl. You pro probably remember that uh, there's a thread in Miyamoto's work. Um, and uh, even moving on, this is our... Uh, Karateka, more or less from the same uh, time period, uh, used the same damsel in distress cliche, uh, but in this case, they used um, uh, a lot of cutscenes to create narrative progression and uh, apply some foreshadowing, which in turn create anticipation engagement uh, towards the final battle with Akuma. Um, and now the bosses are... Uh, perfectly capable now to present a, a story in a way more, a way deeper uh, uh, method. This is uh, Joker from uh, the Arkham, Arkham Knight. And the Arkham series is one of the most amazing, has the most amazing bosses and great storytelling. In this case, the Joker is already dead, but is trying to battle its own, uh, being forgotten. And the first part of that battle is you playing as the Joker. Um, which is a, a, an amazing way of telling a story and, and creates this epic intro towards the battle. And if we're talking about the uh, epic intros, um, I still have shivers down my spine remembering this moment, the first boss in uh, Shadow of the Colossus, creating the, the silence before the storm in preparation for uh, the first epic battle. Uh, another fantastic boss is Bob Barbus from DMC. Um, this uh, this uh, Bill O'Reilly slash Max Hedrom, um, just the presentation for this fight creates this rage and again builds uh, anticipation towards the battle. Going back to uh, the Arkham series, um, uh, the, the intros for the battles in, uh, in this series really allow you to throw the players off. Uh, and uh, this, in this case, this is a, kind of a glitch that they put into the intro to this uh, battle. Uh, when the player sees this thing, uh, they are immediately kind of thrown off their, uh, their element, uh, which makes the anticipation for the battle even, even heightened. And if we're talking about breaking the fourth wall, we all remember uh, Psychomantis from Metal Gear Solid. Um, this battle begins with um, Psychomantis reading your save files and telling you what the games, what games you like, um, forcing you to unplug your controller in order to proceed with the battle. Uh, that really challenges the boundaries of what the game can do, and I believe that the boss battle can really allow you, it's uniquely qualified to do just that. And after the battle is complete, um, 
having some uh, some uh, outlet and a uh, short break uh, allowing you to relish and gloat in the results of the battle and of course advance the story. This is a particularly grotesque ending to the Poseidon battle in God of War 3. And this it might be the first uh, true outro, it also quite grotesque. This is Hitler from Wolfenstein 3D uh, with its famous death cam TM. As a quick anecdote, I had to look up an, a death cam TM and realize that it was indeed a trademark by PUBG, Player Unknown Battleground, which is funny because um, Kill Cam is owned by Activision, so I think that tells the story. <laughs> anyway, all right, moving on to battle setup. Uh, we can fit the boss to its environment and vice versa. Uh, figure out the timing and post-battle results and uh, boss sequencing and interconnection. Um, another early uh, <laughs> boss battles can be found in uh, Kung Fu Master. This is the true level boss. It literally is a boss at the end of every level and also creates an anticipation using the enemy health bar that is visible throughout the level. Um, there's the ending boss, which I played Bubble Bubble multiple times. I never reached level 100 and I didn't even know it had a boss. Um, but there are a few, a few games in history that had a single boss. But there's also the intro boss. This is Fury from 2016, um, which is, uh, I think, a perfect way of introducing the game uh, by starting with a bang, really. So instead of having uh, some endless cutscenes telling you uh, what to do, you can start with a boss that teaches you everything that you need to know. Uh, this is Nemesis oh, from all throughout uh, Resident Evil 3. Um, you battle Nemesis multiple times and in completely unexpected timing every time, so it creates this lingering anticipation and this uh, long engagement. This choice of timing, uh, as we've seen in uh, Bioshock, you choose when to engage your first Big Daddy, uh, and it has some meaningful results for later. Um, Chrono Trigger from 95 had a particular uh, interesting way of uh, giving you a choice of timing. Um, the timeline in which you uh, engage with L Lavos is, uh, really changes the outcome and there are thir 13 different endings based on, on the timeline. Going back to Psychomantis, again, there's so many things to analyze in this battle, but uh, one of the things, that I, the small details that I really enjoy is the fact that how they connect the boss to its environment. So the boss, even using telekinesis, it, it attacks you with uh, picture frames and um, uh, phases, which I think is a, it's a great uh, idea. Uh, once again, the Great Mighty Pooh, uh, well connected to its environment, attacks you with poop and you uh, retaliate by throwing an oversized uh, toilet paper into its gaping mouth. Alright, so connecting the boss with the minions, that's pretty obvious. We creating uh, this unified approach. You, we remember even from Super Mario Brothers that Bowser is actually the king of the turtles uh, and visually looks uh, connected to uh, the minions, to some of them. Um, although, another anecdote is that originally it was uh, designed by Miyamoto as an ox, um, only to be challenged and changed later. Um, looking again at uh, Super Mario Brothers, um, the connection between the boss battles, basically you're, you're battling Bowser every time um, with slightly increasing difficulty, so um, and every time you're sent to a different castle. Uh, but some games really make a point in creating this, uh, in this uh, elaborate story and interconnection between the different uh, bosses. This is Undertale, um, and every boss creates, has a connection both narratively, thematically, even in terms of UI, um, to the previous bosses and uses all everything that you've learned from previous bosses and eventually um, challenges every, every everything so um, every boss feels like it breaks some rule that was established previously. Um, this is the spider from Limbo. I, I definitely believe it's a, a legitimate boss. You, you, you battle it multiple times uh, in the first part of the game. 
Um, and again, there, there are plenty of cases where a single boss can be a challenge multiple times. And in every, every challenge, uh, presents a different skill. And we're going to talk about skills in a moment. Um, uh, personally, my, uh, my second boss in Mushroom 11 was a direct tribute to the spider boss in uh, Limbo, including the part where you, you use uh, the spider's body to move over the acid pit. Um, which is a, a quick point that I wanted to make. Uh, in Mushroom 11, uh, the, after you defeat the boss, there's always an additional challenge that you need to cross. You need to physically cross over to the next world, uh, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting and clever, but uh, to be honest, this is not something I would do again, um, because when the player believes that, or they see that triumph, they believe that they can proceed to the next uh, level, and instead we're challenging them and immediately throwing them back into a new challenge, kind of watering down this excitement and satisfaction. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt to just continue automatically or find a different way to present this challenge. All right, skill, mastery, and teaching. Um, so we're going to talk about the, uh, the skills, how we can design a, ch a challenge to test a specific, specific skill, and how to increase the difficulty and combine multiple skills, and of course the undivided attention that we have uh, to teach new skills. This is the first boss from Shinobi, a game that I uh, really like. Um, that boss is pretty much a, a test for jump and shoot. And it's basically a skill gate for that specific skill. If you don't know how to jump and shoot, you wouldn't survive a minute in the next level. So we're making sure that you're ready for what's next. This is uh, Father Gascoigne from Bloodborne, another game with fantastic bosses. Um, so Father G Gascoigne is essentially a skill gate for parrying um, and allows you to uh, test the basics before increasing the difficulty. Uh, of course, it's not always physical skills. This is Atheon from the Vault of Glass. Um, this is uh, essentially the ultimate test of uh, communication skill and collaboration between raid members. Um, one of my favorite things is, is uh, when bosses actually teach you new, a, a, new, uh, a new skill. This is King Bomb from Super Mario 64. Uh, we are using this undivided attention and no distractions around the boss to teach you something new, which is something that very, very important when you're teaching to not have distractions. Uh, and we introduce a new skill. This is uh, the skill is grab and throw, uh, and we're basically providing a reason for you to utilize that uh, new skill. This boss particularly does a, a, a very clever psychological trick of priming, because if you don't know what you need to do, you can just sit back and see uh, the boss doing the same thing, and that primes you to think about grabbing and throwing. Uh, once again, uh, this is the chain from Fury, the, the intro boss. Uh, I think bosses uh, are perfectly capable uh, of uh, introducing uh, the basic mechanics. In this case, this, is, this boss is the first thing that you see and teaches you all the basic uh, mechanics and, and buttons and uh, skills. Um, this is a very memorable boss, the first boss from our type, one of my favorite bosses, and it uses a great way of, of uh, implicitly teaching you a new, a new technique. In this case, the force spot that you send to infiltrate, uh, it has this curvature there that keeps the force spot in the center right in front of the weak point. Uh, and by seeing the effect, using hindsight bias, you retain the observed uh, result, and that way you it reinforces the teaching of using the uh, force pod. This is Ruby Weapon from Final Fantasy VII. Uh, used as a great way of introducing a modified skill, in this case a handicap. This is um, the Will Send. It's uh, an attack that takes uh, party members off your, uh, off your, uh, of the game. And uh, really changes the way you, you interact with the boss. Another interesting handicap is the last boss in Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, following the tragic loss of your horse, Agro, 
uh, you don't have the spe speed and uh, capabilities that uh, the boss allows you to do, so um, you have to use uh, evasion and stealth in the first uh, phase of the battle. Um, increased risk. Uh, this is the last boss in Sonic 2. Um, in this case, the entire level does not have any rings, which uh, creates this, uh, well, at least illusion of risk, uh, and the boss feels much harder, which is a, kind of a different way of playing the game. This is Berserker, uh, in a game with a first-person shooter, or a third-person shooter, um, where all you need to do is uh, you know, hunt down enemies. In this case, you can't do that. You have to lure the, the enemy to follow you around into the light, to be uh, hunted down by the Hammer of Dawn Death Ray. You know how to sword fight? And um, this is Ray from Uncharted 4. And a lot of bosses that use uh, playable cutscenes, basically, which open up infinite opportunities uh, to introduce different skills. Um, this is not uh, exactly expected, but this is uh, this battle has uh, it's basically a glorified sword fight uh, using uh, two buttons. You know how to sword? So this is GLaDOS, um, the only boss in uh, Portal, uh, which introduces a new constraint. This is the time constraint, or at least the explicit time constraint that was not available before. Um, also, bosses allow you to use multi-skill, uh, combining multi-skill into one epic battle. This is weekly from Portal 2. Uh, which uh, forces you to use all the different things that you learn throughout the game. Uh, going back to Shadow of the Colossus, um, this is a phased set of skills. Every phase has a, a different unique skill that it tests. Uh, the first part forces you to shoot down the sacks. Uh, making the, this uh, sand dragon drop down. The second part is all about timing and speed. The third part is uh, holding on to the body of the dragon. Mr. Freeze is one of my favorite bosses, again, from the Arkham series. Um, this one also tests different particular skills, but uh, gives you the choice of how to in, uh, how to introduce them. Uh, you choose when to try out every different uh, skill, and once you do, the boss even tells you that you cannot use that anymore. He's going to be protected from that, um, which is, I, I believe, a great way of testing out the new skills. And of course, the side skills uh, in a game that's all about, you know, space. Um, space battles. Uh, in this case, the skill is to get a triple seven in space. Um, in um, Metroid Prime, uh, which is a 3D action adventure game, uh, you get kind of a glimpse to a different game. Uh, Spider Gar Guardian is basically a 2D uh, puzzle game, which is again something that only a boss battle can do, if you think about it. Um, yeah, one of my favorites, uh, this is The Bride from Miss Explosion Man. This is a side skill that's a tribute, a hat tip, if you will, to uh, another game. This is basically a tribute to Punch Out. And uh, this is from last year, uh, Dr. Robotnik's Mindy Machine from Sonic Mania, uh, which is a, another glimpse to uh, a different game, a game with the same name, which is essentially a session of Puyo Puyo. All right, let's move on to the actual confrontation. Um, all right, so uh, design attacks, attack patterns around the tested skill that we just in, uh, established and how to really encourage interaction between the boss and the player. Um, Dracula from Castlevania um, is a boss that uh, basically tests um, jumping and hitting from very close range. Uh, now, in order to to support that skill, the attack pattern is uses the negative space that is left by that skill and uh, and shoots and forces the player to get very close to uh, to the boss and jump over it. So, if you think about it, we are using and complementing the skill that we've established. Um, 
Cuphead from last year that did a fantastic job in pretty much every boss uh, in establishing a skill, a specific skill, and then creating a negative space that forces you uh, to, to interact in a certain, uh, in a certain way. Um, bosses, it, it, bullet hells like uh, Dananpachi Daikokatsu is a, are a great example of the idea of uh, the negative space. Because if you think about it, and as we can see, the boss can kill you whenever they want. If the designers wished to kill you, they would just shoot uh, an endless amount of bullets or an, an, a bullet with an infinite speed. The speed. Uh, but in this case, we are actually trying to not kill the player. We're planning, we're planning how to keep them alive. And you can see that even within the bullet hell, there are paths that are allowed for the player to, to, uh, to use. So that's what we're planning. We're planning the paths. Uh, another great example is uh, from Contra. Uh, pretty much uh, a lot of the bosses there um, create the idea of the counter-attack. Um, so you are attacking the boss as they attack you. Um, and that creates kind of a poetic justice, uh, of course. But also, there's, a, uh, there's a, an element here that's very useful for designing a, a boss, which is creating this short time window and a limited space, which forces us to have this confrontation and this cycle of evading and attacking. Um, we saw the King Kupama from N64. This is uh, the DS version, which um, is pretty much exactly the same idea. It teaches you how to grab and throw, but it uses a completely different way. It throws a bomb at you, which again is kind of a cliche of bosses, but it, um, it, it this deflection that it requires puts the player in the line of fire and create, forces this interaction between the boss and the player. Uh, one of my favorite bosses, uh, at least from the Zelda series, is uh, Trinrova, which uh, again creates, uh, forces this interaction between you and the bosses. In this case, you deflect at the attack of one sister against the other. Uh, one of my favorite bosses, Justitia from Bayonetta, is another game with fantastic bosses. Um, in this case, it's another type of counter attack. It creates a path. Um, by attacking you, it creates a path for its own destruction. Um, another version of that can be found in Dingo Dial from Crash Bandicoot Warped. Um, you lure uh, Dingo Dial to shoot at you, thus creating a path that you can use to destroy him. And you can see also that the arena, in this case, was perfectly tailored for this specific battle, which leads us to the arena layout. Again, we're trying to create an arena that complements the battle and is based on that specific uh, fight. This is Cyber Demon from Doom from 2016. Um, in both phases of the battle, the arena is very small, um, open, no place to hide, um, kind of reminiscent of old, olden times as well, um, and it increases the confrontation. And if even further so, um, during uh, the second phase, it uses this uh, temporary layout change that even it, it creates this lane that uh, uh, restricts your motion uh, and makes the confrontation even more uh, more obvious. Keep your eyes on the but the idea is that the the arena is always uh, designed and tailored to the, that specific boss battle. This is a, a boss that moves extremely fast and is partially invisible. You don't know where the, uh, by looking where the attacks come from, you know where the boss would be, and also they made a lot of fences and barriers that you can use in order to protect yourself. Uh, also, a bunch of different hubs for interaction. Um, lighting can also be used as a great way of uh, introducing a, a layout. Um, in this case, the boss, in spec the Spectre Knight boss in Shovel Knight, uh, uses the shadows to hide. And if you haven't noticed how it moves in the first phase of the fight, you wouldn't even know how to uh, interact with it. So it kind of teaches and then tests your ability. And one of the most important points in boss battles 
is the attack space. And I'm, I'm referring to the idea that you can employ multiple approaches or strategies against the boss. I think a good boss can be beaten in multiple ways, or at least um, different players can interact with it in a different, in different way. Uh, in this case, this is Ornstein and Smile from Dark Soul. Uh, and a, a fantastic boss that is particularly re remembered because of the two uh, bosses, really. Um, one of them is uh, quick and weak, and the other one is uh, very powerful and slow. And you choose how to interact uh, with that boss, and, uh, and you form your own strategy. Um, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not a huge RPG player, but uh, this is also a memorable uh, boss battle, this Archimon from Dark Dragon Age Origins. Uh, it's also known for its various different strategies can be used in order to beat the boss. Once again, Big Daddy. Um, it's one of the first games that allows you to have these, these different approaches and, and, and emergent behaviors. You can beat uh, Big Daddies by using shotguns, electricity, uh, uh, telekinetic kinetically moving booby traps and even uh, hypnotizing one big daddy against another. All right, moving on to clarity. Um, we need to make sure that we avoid unpredictability, obscurity, and randomness by setting clear goals, progression, and hits, and predictable attacks. So uh, the idea of a clear target is very obvious. We all know that uh, we've kind of gotten used to the idea of a glowing uh, weak spot, which creates a clear vulnerability and a call to action. There's even a, a funny uh, article from The Onion exactly on that. Um, creating a, a clear call to action is extremely important. This is an example from Shadow of the Colossus, particularly when you have a, a large boss with multiple uh, weak points, the sigils. Um, it force, forces us as designers to create uh, some sort of guidance as needed. Um, in this case, the sword that lights up the, the next target. Um, in some cases, um, guidance is not needed. This is a uh, dark link. Um, you don't need to know particular, its particular uh, weak spots because it is you. You know its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, that reminded me of Mirror Prince from Prince of Persia. The, uh, the, the first phase, the first part of the game, you create this uh, Mirror Prince by going through a mirror. Uh, the second part you have to battle it. And in this case, the challenge is a logical challenge, figuring out how to beat it by lowering your sword and moving uh, into him. Um, and this is the puzzle battle. And I, I really enjoy bosses that are employ logic. Um, and figuring out the goal is, is the challenge in this case. And, and one thing that's very, very important, and I can talk a lot about this, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the idea is that you either employ logic or skill, but try to avoid doing the both at the same exact time. Uh, the reason is what I call the delta of chance, and I'm going to talk about that later. Delta of chance is that when you believe that you've succeeded, and then immediately fail because there's an additional challenge, or, and vice versa, um, that creates a a very unsatisfying moment. Um, clear progression. We we talked about the glowing red point, which creates a focal call to action. Um, we can also see that uh, this p particular game and most games of the time uh, have a, the clear hit. You can see a couple of frames that change the color. Uh, and but also, of course, the health bar, uh, which we've all grown accustomed to in, in many bosses. Um, not every boss has uh, uh, health bars. In some cases, you don't really need it, as long as you have a clear understanding of how far you've gotten. This is uh, the first phase of Hive Mind in Dead Space. Uh, there are a couple of pods that you, five pods that you need to destroy, and by seeing how many you have left, you, you have a clear understanding of the progression. Um, early, in the early games, this is a Space Harrier, they used a kind of a weird trick of changing the color of the box um, as they lose health. Um, but that trick has been kind of long gone, it kind of limits your visual design abilities. An interesting aspect, is, uh, way of, of presenting your progression is, is uh, done in Cuphead. Um, so instead of showing you the progression during the battle, they do it when you die. Which, if you think about it, is actually quite clever because 
this is where you, you potentially lose players um, just before a potential rage quit. They can see how far they've gotten. So that's a, a very interesting uh, uh, prospect. Uh, it also shows you the phase, which gives you even further indication of where you are. Uh, talking about Cuphead, um, it's incredibly important to have a predictable attack um, because predictability is control. And when you know how the bullets, or the many different bullets or attack types, uh, go in the next frame, you have control over the battle. And as long as you have information and time to react, uh, you can beat any boss. Um, some bosses kind of put you in a position where you don't have enough time. This is again uh, the first boss in uh, Shinobi, which is notorious for its uh, randomness in the attacks. Um, I think in this case they actually wanted to create this panic um, in order for, to, to force the player to use the magic. But generally randomness is very risky. Going back to Space Harrier, um, another in important point, interesting point is that um, while in 2D it's very clear to see an attack coming, uh, it's very clear to extrapolate its position, um, in 3D it's not that easy. We're, I think we've evolved in a way that a, a change in scale is not that visible. Um, some games, uh, some 3D games do it better. Um, so going back to Cyber Demon, uh, as, as long as it's, it, it's visible enough that something is going directly at you, um, then you should be fine. In this case, the flare behind the, the rocket gives you just enough information to know if a, an attack is coming directly at you. Um, another cool trick from the Bar Barbus fight, um, it always attacks you sideways and then clamping towards you. Again, giving you just enough information uh, and time to react. But you don't always have enough uh, information or time to react. Uh, or time to react, so you have to compensate with enough information. Uh, the the preemptive shadow, as I call it here, um, is uh, highlighting where the hit is going to land. And this is uh, both the fireballs and uh, and the bombs as well. So. And if you think about it, it kind of compensates for the lack of information that we as, as spectators have. Um, if Mario can look up and see the, the bombs falling, we don't have that luxury. So by providing that uh, guidance, it gives us just enough information to react. Um, this is uh, Hellblade. And in Hellblade, of course, and in many other games, they use uh, preemptive animation. It gives you well enough time to see when and where the next attack is coming by having this animation of, uh, of the enemy. Also, it uses another cool trick to introduce um, a, this, this telegraphing um, by actually literally saying that attack, attacks are coming behind you using the voices in Sinua's head, which I thought was brilliant. Um, this is El Anchador from Raymond Legends. Uh, it uses multiple telegraphing methods. Um, you have the shadow that gives you information on the position of the location of the attack and the animation for the timing. So with animation, with the timing and the position, you have just enough information to respond. Another cool telegraphing method used in the Master Hand in Super Smash Bros. throughout the series. Uh, these uh, kind of implicit uh, hand gestures give you enough information to know when the next attack is coming. Oh, this should be fun. Um, once again, Rafe and other battles in the franchise. Uh, if you notice, just before the hit lands, um, it slows it down just enough to give you uh, time uh, to react, which is some sort of telegraphing, but kind of changing reality slightly. Oh, this should be fun. <clears throat> so the first battles in uh, Punch Out, uh, they start pretty slowly. They have a lot of uh, uh, preemptive animations, giving you just enough time to respond. 
but as the battles progress and uh, it gets harder and harder, you have less and less time to react. And in fact, the Mike Tyson battle doesn't really give you enough time to respond to any attack. And the only way you would know what to do is by observing the previous attacks and timing them and memorize them uh, and basically anticipate in order to survive because the previous waves uh, uh, telegraph the next waves. And that's what you see also in Cuphead many, many times. The first attack, like in this case the egg, is extremely risky. You don't even know what it does. And in fact, if you're in the wrong place, you, you would die the first time you see it. Uh, but once you see it once, you know how to react the next time. And this happens constantly uh, in this game. It works very well for a game that has you know, a lot of uh, these interacts, a lot of deaths. Uh, this is a... A less common example, this is Little Horn from Super Meat Boy. This entire boss is built on memorization. It has 13 different stages that you need to memorize each one of them in order to survive. Um, which works very well for this game because it, this game is all about dying multiple times. Alright, let's move on to difficulty. All right, we're going to talk about Delo, Delta of Chance, which I mentioned before, and uh, the fact that we are here to reward and not to punish. So the Delta of Chance. Um, if you look at any phase or any even attack type in a boss or any, any, um, any kind of uh, interaction with an enemy, you usually see, or you better see, a challenging peak followed by a foreseeable end. You can actually see where it's going to end. Uh, and a noticeable easing uh, uh, between them. And the idea of delta of chance is that, well, a positive delta of chance uh, puts you in a position where you see an anticipated failure and heightened risk followed by an anticipated triumph. Not immediate triumph, but an anticipated triumph. And that translates um, directly into the behavior of, uh, of dopamine. Uh, now, I'm not a chemist, a biochemist, but from, it's pretty recent that they uh, uh, studied this neurotransmitter and realized that uh, its behavior uh, really rewards and encourages behavior that leads to a, a positive change uh, in, your, in your behavior. Um, and there's always kind of a, a, a low dosage of dopamine that changes, uh, it peaks when you have this positive delta of chance and completely stops when you have the negative delta of chance, kind of an evolutionary way of teaching you how to work uh, and, and advance in the world. Um, in our world, uh, you can kind of imagine that if you think about the playing game of Tetris, where you can see that you're almost going to fail and then you see that the next piece is a long piece. Uh, sometimes you would want to kind of wait and extend that amazing moment that you know that you've just survived. Uh, and that feeling is what I believe is one of the most important and uh, one of the biggest takeaways I think you should have from this talk is, and, and this is something that I also learned uh, kind of recently because I, I made a game that is extremely difficult, you probably know that. Um, the idea of uh, making sure that there's a, a challenging peak followed by a kind of Anticipated, anticipated triumph is extremely important, and I can see this in pretty much all the good bosses that I surveyed. Um, and this is one of the reasons why this boss is so wonderful, because every attack wave has a uh, very challenging peak right in the middle of that attack. You are attacked by multiple different pieces. Um, you are forced in this very narrow space. Um, and once you survive this, you start seeing less and less pieces coming towards you and they get more anticipated. You see where they're coming because those are the only ones left. And the, there's a good one second where you know that you've survived a very difficult challenge. And that second is extremely addicting and uh, satisfying. And I think this is what we're looking for. A great example is from Intruder uh, from Gradius 2. Um, the first part uh, is a one single uh, fire snake and then you hit it and it splits into three. That moment becomes extremely difficult. But once you hit one snake and then the second one, you know that you survived it. The, the last part, the last few seconds are just very, very easy. Um, so you have a few seconds of this wonderful uh, satisfaction. 
uh, another great way, going back to hive mind, um, the first phase of the battle, after you removed, uh, you destroyed the third pod, you're picked up always by the tentacle. Uh, and at that point, it seems like it gets a little harder because uh, you're airborne, it's harder to aim. But really, there's no risk anymore because you're, you're not subject to the attacks of the tentacles. So, uh, subconsciously, you know that you've beat the first uh, phase. And those few seconds of you aiming are, are very satisfying. Now, this is not exactly a boss, but somehow it keeps coming back over and over again in discussions on the favorite bosses. This is a, a, a song from Guitar Hero 3, and I started looking at it and tried to figure out why people like it so much and mention it as a boss, and it had the same traits uh, and uh, qualities of a good boss. It has attack waves that heighten towards a very challenging, crazy peak, and once you reach that peak and cross it, it starts slowing down towards this satisfying moment where you can just kind of rest. You know you succeeded until the next one. And it's also very memorizable because it's a song. You, you, you know how to do this. All right, let's quickly talk about multi-phases. Um, now, there's a notion of creating phases just in order to extend uh, the gameplay, and uh, this is something that I really don't enjoy. I, I, I don't think that creating a long boss battle is something that's extremely important. It's not a way for you to extend uh, how, how long people play your game. Uh, you are here to reward the player and provide some, uh, uh, in this case, break before increasing the difficulty slightly or, or change the battle or change it to a different skill. I also suggest uh, you know, taking into consideration the delta of chance, so uh, make the break more anticipated and uh, some, apply some easing towards it. Um, some great examples for phasing, as we've seen with the Sand Dragon, uh, where each phase introduces a different challenge. Um, this is a great boss battle from Nier Automata from last year, uh, Soshi. The first phase, you have this uh, force field that uh, protects the boss. You can't attack it, but you can learn how it moves. The second part, where they uh, uh, turn off the power, you can actually attack it, but you don't really see very well. So those are those two phases really complement each other very well. Um, and last example from the Arkham series, this is Russell Ghoul. Um, where each one of the phases changes the rules completely. The, the oversized boss, then uh, gravity or multiple uh, instances. Um, so I think that the idea is that every phase can break the rules in a different way. Now let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the difficulty level and pacifism. Um, a lot of games introduce multiple uh, difficulty level th uh, throughout the game. You can change it, uh, you can it just, the entire game becomes easier. Um, Cuphead actually allows you to change the difficulty level per boss. Um, there are other bosses that give you the idea of uh, non-fighting option, or maybe this is the basic option, but uh, in, in any case, whether or not you fight the boss, um, the challenge is still maintained. It's a different challenge. If you have the fire, uh, fire flower, then you hit the boss. If you, if you don't have it, you're using timing instead. Um, and again, the, non, the idea that non-fighting options can still maintain some challenge can be seen in Master from Fallout. Um, in certain circumstances, and if you go through a, a specific uh, branch of the dialogue, you can actually convince Master to uh, self-destruct and avoid a very, very difficult battle. And if you think about it, it's not that you skipped the, ba the battle. Um, you just you create a different challenge for yourself. It's more a logical challenge than, than a physical one. Um, and a great example is through Undertale. Um, there are many types of confrontations, and uh, confrontations can, uh, can end without a fight. In fact, there's a, a true pacifist throughout that is also considered, I think, as the true ending for the game, uh, that you can just avoid fighting all the bosses. And, and the challenge is still there. It's, it's a slightly different challenge. 
um, there are other games that allow you to skip bosses because, again, this, the boss is a reward. Uh, if the player so chooses, they can just avoid the battle. And this is Spire of the Dragon, uh, where we can use collectibles to progress and you know go through the balloonists. Uh, you can just avoid the battle if you have enough of the thing that you're collecting. And it's all about if, if the player just enjoys collecting, but they don't enjoy uh, fighting, then that's their choice. And finally, um, Monster Hunter World, um, the, the whole point is that you choose the battles. Uh, you, you take on quests and it's all for your own personal advancement. It's, uh, the, the battle is a reward, it's, it's part of the game. It's not a punishment that you have to endure uh, in order to, to get to the next world. Um, so, a couple of words on skipping. So, you need to ask yourself when you design a boss, is this boss uh, essential to the progression? Does it teach you something that you have to learn? Um, does it make sure that you're not gonna be hurt later? And if not, then are you really excluding some unable players that you considered as non-deserving? You remember that the battle must be rewarding, but players can uh, enjoy different types of challenges. Um, so I, urge you to consider uh, easy mode uh, or alternate challenges. For example, I can definitely see uh, start designing bosses that can be either challenged physically or logically, and both, uh, both ways are completely acceptable. And of course, even skipping the boss, because it's the player's choice. Uh, if you want, you can always award the main path with uh, special items or access to different, different parts of the map if you so choose, or even different endings as we've seen with some other games. Uh, and if you think about it, it actually re increases your replay value because if you let the players go all the way to the ending, they would enjoy and probably want to re return to the bosses again, play them uh, in like the original main path. It also exposes more people uh, to your art. And this is a per personal, um, you know, personal thing for me because I, I spent around two months working on an ending for Mushroom 11 uh, that only less than 10% less than of the players actually reached because the bosses, for example, and other challenges were extremely difficult. And, uh, and most importantly, this allows us to really work towards uh, true inclusiveness and uh, while not skipping on the actual challenge. So, in summary, I'm just gonna call this out real quick. Uh, these are the rules. Uh, reward, tell a story, locally source, skill test and intro, do not try to kill, keep everything clear, allow player expression during the battle, phase wisely, mind the difficulty curve and the delta of chance, and of course, most importantly in boss battles, rules are meant to be broken. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, line up in front of the mics if we have time. We yeah, have uh, three minutes. Go ahead. Hey, uh, um, so you went over a lot of, obviously, what the best bosses in games are, but what are the worst tropes that you would consider? So this, I had a bunch of those, uh, and and just as respect to my fellow designers, I try to avoid showing too many bad examples. I touched on a couple of things that I found um, not as useful. I, I showed, uh, I think, some of the bosses in Shinobi, for example, um, sh kind of uh, implemented some things that I would not necessarily implement in my own games. Um, and again, I didn't want to talk about this too much, but uh, some of the bosses and the challenges in my own game were extremely difficult. And uh, this is, this all has been a, a, a personal learning for me, figuring out how uh, and what makes a, a good boss battle. So uh, I, I think, I, I would definitely say my own game has some flaws. Um, go ahead. So you mentioned having an easy mode for skipping really, or some way of skipping really hard bosses, but easy mode has a little bit of a stigma if, with a lot of players. Is there a different way that that could be presented than just saying easy mode for bosses? 
so actually, the, the, one of the things that I, I try to kind of mention in my uh, final slide there is that we actually need to battle the stigma. Uh, sure, I mean, we can figure out other ways of introducing easy mode. And I, I, I do agree that I, I, don't like, I don't like using UI to tell you what you're playing. This is kind of puts you in, in the mindset, this it primes you into thinking that you're actually not as good as you are by just saying the word easy. So that's, that's a really important point, and I do agree with you. Uh, however, the idea that we need to care about what some people say because they don't feel that other players deserve to play the hard mode is something that we as designers need to challenge. Um, I think this one. Oh, hey, great talk. Uh, yeah, so uh, Breath of the Wild, my experience with that was I played uh, as much of the game as possible before getting to the final boss, and mm -hmm. the final boss was super short because I was way overpowered, and I, find, I, I felt like I sort of missed uh, the intended experience, or I, I, at least I felt as if I, uh, it wasn't as satisfying for me. Um, have you thought about this, uh, and what are your thoughts? I hated that fight. <laughs> it was, I, 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 we were very, me and Julia, we played it together, and we got to the boss um, with a lot of power, and I, I actually didn't like that battle too much. I thought it was, um, I thought it was, I don't know, laid out in a way that was uh, kind of extended too much. Uh, and I, I actually like most of a lot of the boss battles that Nintendo has, that kind of have everything very laid out, laid out very well, where every phase has a different challenge. And I think maybe part of the thing, and, and to be fair, one of the amazing things that I love so much about Breath of the Wild is that you can, you can have multiple approaches to do every single thing. But the problem is that you can't balance everything to the maximum. So in some cases, there are some strategies that are just better. And you probably found those. And I didn't and I'll ask you what he did later, but honestly, I, um, I think this really allows this elaborate expression space for the players. So in some sense, you just, I think maybe you played it very well and you missed some of the things. But, uh, I guess that's part of the challenge for designing it. So in a game that's focused around boss battles like Shadow of the Colossus, how would these rules change? How do you uh, continue to teach when, or connect to the minions when there aren't minions, there are just bosses? Um, so that's, that's actually a great example. And I, I was trying to not go over too many things because already I had uh, 115 slides. Um, basically, the idea of boss rush and games that uh, only have bosses um, I think Monster Hunter is, is a great example um, of kind of the nonlinear way of uh, giving you the choice of when to challenge a certain boss. Um, but in this case, the way it, I see Shadow of the Colossus is that really, if you think about it, every, um, every boss or every uh, uh, Colossus uh, is, uh, is, a, is a level. And that level usually has multiple different challenges throughout that level. And usually, towards the end of the level, for example, the head of that monster, that's the boss, if you think about it. Um, but each one of them, and that's something that I enjoyed tremendously in that game, is that uh, each one of those bosses introduce, introduces something else. Um, so I, I, thought, I thought it worked out for that game. I hope it answers your question. First of all, uh, thank you kindly for giving this uh, ins highly insightful speech. Thank now, uh, earlier during the talk, actually at the very beginning, you did mention Silent Hill Homecoming. And that got me thinking, how exactly do you try to get boss fights right in a survival horror game, which emphasizes tension through uh, tight resource management and also feelings of occasional helplessness and powerful, uh, powerlessness? Oh, that's that's a great question. And um, to be fair, I only played a few. Um, so um, what I what I felt is that in terms in terms of the boss battles in uh, Silent Hill, really, uh, I, I, what I saw this is that in a, gr a great example how the theme uh, really worked out with the mechanic. In this case, um, as you said, this this uh, uh, this this 
anxiousness, this pressure that you feel while playing it, really gets complemented by the visuals uh, in, in some way. It, it, it could have been, by the way, just as useful, if you think about it, if this would be a kind of a you know, happy, you know, smiley face. But, but the idea of creating this, um, uh, this perfect, perfectly unified uh, set of uh, behaviors and mechanics that support uh, the technology support the mechanics that supports the visuals. I, I think I think that worked out very well. I, I'm not sure if I answered your question though, but no, I think you answered it uh, pretty well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again as well, and and you put a lot of work into that, which is fantastic. We went through a whole lot of examples. Uh, the majority of those examples were single player boss battles. Do your rules change? Does your focus change when we're looking at multiplayer and particularly more than just two people uh, attacking a boss? I think this is this is a great example, but if you think about it, it actually answers the same the same question because you you need to ask yourself what are the skills that you're trying to uh, tr trying to challenge. So um, I don't think I would be able to play Athian okay. very well. Um, I I know I wouldn't. So so this is one of those things that as I I'm seeing other people play it, I can see how they created a set of challenges that are particularly there and not in other bosses necessarily uh, to, to um, challenge the collaboration. For example, in a lot of bosses in, uh, in Destiny, you can see where, where other players are. So they created this time portal so you couldn't see that. Um, so so for, every different, for every different skill, you create a challenge, kind of a negative space. So it's easy to talk about the negative space in 2D games or 3D games where, like, I'm, you know, I want you to jump, so I'm going to shoot a couple of times to make sure that you jump as high as possible. Uh, but also, if, you, if I want to challenge your collaboration, then I'm going to put the players in a position that they can see each other. Hey, so how would you handle having multiple, like a boss battle in a game that has, is like a hero-based shooter or something like that? So for example, if Overwatch had a boss battle and you could choose any of their 24 characters, like assuming that the design philosophy is not to limit player choice in which characters they can bring into that battle. Um, so I, I, can you, can you, Repeat that question. I, I think I sure. Yeah, just it's a pretty vague question, but like, what are some ideas on how you would handle a boss battle that, uh, like, where the player basically has too many options available and how they could approach the battle? I think that's a great point because I was talking about uh, the uh, player expression space is something that is underutilized right now. There are a lot of bosses that um, the expression space is limited to. You know, am I going to jump over two bullets or, or one bullet at a time? Um, and I showed uh, Ornstein and Smau from Dark Souls, which kind of gives you this idea of like, okay, I'm going to go th uh, go through this one first and, and lead. Uh, when you have uh, too much choice, you have you know choice paralysis. So I, I, in some in some way, I think that's also kind of the art of designing. And and to be fair, I think when that's why I led. My, my talk here to talk first about the, the, the skill set that you would like to challenge. Once you establish a skill set, or a multiple skill set, but, but there has to be some sort of clarity in what you're, cha what you're choosing, what you're presenting, what you're challenging the player with. I think that uh, just presenting too many different things kind of puts you in, in, a, in a point where the player would be helpless in a sense. Uh, so I think, again, that, that's, that's part of my point. I, there's no perfect way to tell you how to design a boss. Um, like, how do you place the bullets? What kind of, uh, you know, how it moves from side to side? How do you, you know, you attack towards the player or towards where they're going? All these things are, are you know, eventually it's the, the, the art of, the, of designing. But in a sense, just having the clear view of what you're challenging uh, I think that's extremely important, and that needs to be uh, limited, but not singular. All right. All right. I think we're out of time, so thank you very much.